If you are a kid, you can come on down to the front for the children's moment. Morning. How are you doing? Good morning. Got all sorts of people. So, last week, the youth went on a trip to Kentucky. Do you know where that is? No, it's just down south. And throughout the trip, we looked at a verse in Micah, which is a book from the Old Testament. One part we focused on goes like this. The Lord wants us to love kindness, do justice, and walk humbly with God. Who here likes to read and write? We got one. Anyone else? Two? Three? I see some hands out in the crowd. <laughs> As Jackson mentioned, one of the themes during our week was love kindness. And during our mission trip, we visited the Carnegie Center. And the Carnegie Center's mission statement is to empower people to explore and express their voices through imaginative learning and the later literary arts. Jonathan was the youth director, and he showed us kindness through his genuine interest in conversation with us, through his guidance, and through his support while we cleaned. While we were there, we cleaned and prepared the center for a backpack donation, which is one of their biggest events during the years. And the backpacks that they donate each year are for kids in need. Have you guys ever been shown kindness before? I've been shown kindness before. People like to hold the door open for me. That's good. One of the themes was doing justice. Do you know what justice means? Almost. Justice is kind of like fairness. So when we were in Kentucky, we helped with a special summer camp called the Nathaniel Mission. Have you ever gone to a summer camp? Have you guys? No? St. Jude. Jude or George? George. George. The Nathaniel Mission is like a fun school for kids who normally don't get the chance to go to a summer camp. There, we helped clean up the whole building, giving them a nice space to learn. Um, do you have any pets? Do you have any pets? What pets? All right. So when you, your dogs have to go outside, right? What do they do outside? Yeah. And then you have to pick it up, right? Somebody has to pick it up. So, when, when you are, when somebody picks it up, they're being humble, which is a big word. It means that you're putting yourself below others and doing something that they wouldn't want to do. And so, we went to the equine center and saw horses, and we also picked up their poop. Um, and we weeded, but we were being humble and helping, and at the equine center, they give riding lessons to disabled people who couldn't do it without them, so they're being humble and helping others too. Thanks for listening. <laughs> We're going to have Brittany pray, and then you guys can head to Kids Church. Yeah, so guys, this is something, um, the youth, go, they go on a trip every single summer. And sometimes it's to something fun, and to other times, you know, they go to a conference where they learn about God, they get to worship a lot. But this time, they went on a trip so they could help others. And I think all of you learned something about yourselves, for sure learned about others, 
um, but also got to see God at work in some place so different from where we are. And so this is something that you guys will get to do when you're a little bit older. Do you think you want to go and go to Kentucky and clean up some poop? No? Okay. Well, we'll work on it. We'll work on it. All right. Well, let us pray before you guys go to Kids Church with uh, Pastor Chris and his family. Let us just pray that we can do all those things here in what we do, okay? Repeat after me. Dear God, thank you. Thank you. For giving us people, giving us people. who show us how to do justice, to show mercy and love, and to walk humbly. Lord, give me opportunities to do those things. Help me. In your name I pray. Amen. All right, you guys are going to head off that way and follow Pastor Chris. Thank you guys. with this one. Is that okay with you? Good. All right, before we get to our second reading today, we're going to take some time to pray and ask for the Holy Spirit to be with us. Please pray with me. Breath of God, let us feel your presence here among us. Help us to hear these stories with open ears, with open minds, and open hearts. Lord, show us a new way today, a new way of living, a new way of thinking, a new way of loving. We ask this in your Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So, we are hanging out in the book of Ruth today, and we're pretty much reading half of the book of Ruth, <laughs> because we are talking about Boaz. Um, so, in our first reading that Jackson read for us, we learn who Boaz is. And for those of you who don't remember, um, Ruth and Naomi have lost their husbands. Naomi is the mother-in-law. And she tells her two daughters-in-law to go return to their lands. They're, she can't offer them anything else. And, and her one daughter-in-law goes off. But Ruth vows to stay no matter what. And so they find their way back in the land of Israel. And Naomi is older. So Ruth takes the lead. She goes into a field um, that has some connection to, Ru to Naomi's family. And she finds favor with Boaz. In chapter 3, before we pick up where we're going to read now, Ruth approaches Boaz. She encounters him and basically proposes that they get married, basically, <laughs> um, to, sum it, to summarize it. And he agrees, she agrees. And now Boaz is doing what he has to do in order to marry Ruth. Picking up in Ruth chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. Hear now the word of the Lord. No sooner had Boaz gone up to the gate and sat down there than the next of kin, of whom Boaz had spoken, came passing by. So Boaz said, come over, friend, sit down here. And he went over and sat down. Then Boaz took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. He then said to the next of kin, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our kinsman, Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me so that I may know, for there is no one prior to you to redeem it, and I come after you. So he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, the day you acquire the field from the hand of Naomi, you are also acquiring Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of the dead men. 
to maintain the dead man's name on his inheritance. At this, the next of kin said, Ooh, I cannot redeem it for myself without damaging my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm a transaction. One party took off a sandal and gave it to the other. This was the manner of attesting to Israel. So when the next of kin said to Boaz, acquire it for yourself, he took off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have acquired from the hand of Naomi all that belong to Elimelech and all that belong to Chilion and Malon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, the wife of Malon, to be my wife, to maintain the dead man's name on his inheritance, in order that the name of the dead may not be cut off from his kindred and from the gate of his native place. Today you are witnesses. Then all the people were at the gate, along with the elders. We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you produce children in Ephrathah and bestow a name in Bethlehem. And through the children that the Lord will give you by this young woman, may your house be like the house of Perez, who Tamar bore to Judah. This, my friends, is the word of the Lord. I have a fondness for the book of Ruth. I don't know if any of you could guess why. But I love the book of Ruth. It is a story that contrasts the book of Judges that came right before it. Last week, you guys talked about Samson with, with Chris. And I heard a few of you learn many things about Samson that you never knew. But in the book of Judges, it is so violent. So violent. And then this story comes right after it. And it talks about the time during Judges. But it tells a completely different story. It tells a personal story. A story of loss. A story of hopelessness of redemption, and of new life. Like I said in the beginning before I read the verse, Ruth vows to Naomi to never leave her side. Where you go, I go. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I die, and I will be buried. She makes this vow to her, and they go on together, and they don't know what the future holds. And a lot of the times, we focus on Ruth and that vow that she makes and the risk that she takes when she could go back to her own country. She's still young. She could go find another husband. Naomi releases her from her duty. But instead, she remains loyal. And then we meet Boaz. We don't know a lot about Boaz, but... The clues that we pick up in the story are this. He's prominent in the community. They know him. Everyone knows Boaz. You know Bo? I know Bo, right? He connects people. He's also very wealthy. He's rich, as the text says. That means he has a lot of land, probably a lot of animals, a lot of resources, lots of servants. He's also older. I don't know if you picked up, but he calls Ruth my daughter. And that's probably just a sign of respect, right? He's, he's acknowledging that he's way older, she's way younger, right? She, he wouldn't be calling her ma'am. It's my daughter. But there's something else about Boaz. When he comes to his field, he's someone that comes to his field, and he looks out, and he notices things. He notices changes. He notices the people and the small details. So when he comes to his field and he sees a new face, he immediately asks the question of the overseer, who does she belong to? Now some of you are like, belong? That sounds odd. And it does. But it doesn't mean that she is a slave. He doesn't think that. Because in 
biblical times in the Old Testament in this culture that we are situated in. A woman is always known by the male head of the family, all right? So if somebody was asking me, whom do you belong to? It would be Paul. I belong to that guy. I'm his daughter, right? So he asked that question, but the overseer does something. Instead of saying who she belongs to, he starts with, she is a Moabite. You see, Moabites were not well liked by the Israelites. In the book of Numbers, we have a story um, about the Israelites in the wilderness. And in the wilderness, they come across um, the Moabs and the Midianites. And, and this whole situation takes place where they want to send a curse. The Moabites want to curse the Israelites. And it doesn't go according to plan, but it causes quite the complicated situation. And so then we have in the book of Deuteronomy where it says, no Moabite shall enter the congregation of the Lord. Even to the 10th generation, no Moabite shall join the congregation of the Lord forever. All right, that's, I mean, that's pretty clear, right? <laughs> no Moabites allowed. So in this culture, there's a lot of prejudice when it comes to Moabites. You say the name Moabite and everybody goes, oh. So that's what the overseeing is doing. I know you asked me a question, but she's a Moabite. And then he says, but you know, she came with Ruth, or she came with Naomi, and they returned from the land of Moab. If he didn't make it clear, he starts with Moabite and ends with Moab. I just want you to know, Boaz, she's a Moabite. But he does not seem to be startled by that fact at all. Instead, he recognizes the connection, the family connection. He is related to her father-in-law, to her mother-in-law. And so he does something. He calls her and he says, hey, glean in this field, stay in this field, because he recognizes that there is danger. She's a young woman. She has no male heir. She has no male companion or family to look over her to make sure that she's safe. She's working in a field with men that are overseeing her. You can probably guess what could happen to someone who no one cares about because of who she is. And she has no attachments. People often take advantage of people like that. And so he says, stay in this field, you will be protected. Glean in this field. Do as much as you would like. I'll make sure no one harms you. And so she does. And then he goes a step further. And he tells his men the same thing. Do not touch her. Do not reproach her. Do not interfere with her. Because you're going to answer to me. He does not have to do that. But he does. He ensures her safety when she is getting food for her mother-in-law and herself. And we think, wow, Boaz has done a lot right now. But then he goes another step, and he tells the workers, leave sheaves behind. Take handfuls and just throw them down. You see, gleaning was just taking whatever was left, whatever the harvesters didn't collect, right? Because nobody's perfect. They don't get it to the very end of the row. But now he says, just pull out some and leave it down there for her. She collects so much that she has it. And then she's invited to share a meal with the workers of the field and Boaz. He makes sure that she is safe, that she has resources, and that she is well fed. Something that her and Naomi had not had in a long time. They are poor, they are impoverished, they are alone. After Naomi devises this plan for Ruth to go to Boaz and approach him, and they decide that they want to join in marriage, <laughs> an easy way to put it, 
he says, I have to get everything in order because Boaz leaves no detail to fate. He is going to make sure that everything is crossed and the I's are dotted. Everything is taken care of. So he says, I have to talk to this relative. There was this law in um, the book of Leviticus about a redeemer, a goel. And you could redeem your family out of slavery, out of poverty, by purchasing land for them, or by purchasing them, them out of slavery. And it was the male, the closest male relative was given that option first. But there was also called leveret marriage. And so what would happen is if everybody died, as in Naomi and Ruth's case, the next male heir had the opportunity to marry Naomi or Ruth. Now, Naomi's old. So Ruth is the one that Boaz is speaking about. And he kind of plays a trick on the closest relative, right? He goes to him, he says, hey, Naomi's back. You want to buy your land? You can have it. And he's like, you want to sell me more land? Like, thank you, right? Land was the way to have power. Land was the way to ensure that you were rich, that you were wealthy, that you were taken care of, that your family had um, some sort of status in the community. So yeah, I want to buy more land. Sign me up. Oh, but you also get Naomi. Oh. Well, I don't want it. You see, as soon as he marries Naomi and as soon as she has a male heir, that son is named after her ex or her husband who has passed away. He carries on the line. That was the deal. And then that son gets to have the land. He don't like that. I want my land for my sons for my name, for my pro prosperity and posterity. It's too much of a risk. And so he says, you take it. And Boaz is okay with that situation. He's already made this deal with Ruth. But this Goel, this redeemer, this is something that this word is used all throughout the Bible. In, in Isaiah, God is the redeemer of Israel. He is the one that is going to purchase them from the hand of the enemy, from the yoke of slavery, out of exile. He's going to bring them into the promised land yet again. And then we also call Christ our redeemer. He is the one that takes us back from the grip of sin and death from that cycle of violence that we see in Judges, from our own human nature that fails again and again, Jesus is the one that redeems us. And in Jesus, we, we find someone who takes off his divinity to come down and be with us in all of our humanity. And if that was not enough, he then walks among us and lives just like us, is criticized, is wounded, is killed. He goes to the cross for us to redeem us. Jesus is going one step further every single time, just like Boaz. Boaz in this narrative shows us Hesed, the loving kindness of our God. He is a righteous Israelite. He knows the laws. He knows what it says about the Moabite. He knows what it says about what a redeemer is to do. But he does more. It's just like when that lawyer talks to uh, Jesus and they're talking about the greatest commandment. And Jesus answers him with saying, what do you think it is? He says, to love your, the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And then the lawyer asks, who's my neighbor? 
And he tells the story about the Good Samaritan, Samaritans, the, the people that were despised by the Jewish people in Jesus' time. And he says, that Samaritan was a neighbor to the one who was wounded on the side of the road. And we know that story, right? He takes him to a hotel. He binds up his wounds. And then he goes one step further and says, here's some money. I want you to take care of him until he's all better. He didn't have to do that, but he does. That's a redeemer. That is someone that goes way beyond the expectation or what the law says or what society says is adequate. Christ himself says, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And every time he goes beyond what the law says, he lives it out in a way that is risky, that is scandalous, that does more than what the law states. Because that's what a redeemer does. A redeemer goes the extra mile to ensure that everybody has what they need, that they feel loved, that they feel taken care of, that the opportunity that they have is a future full of hope. One thing that I got to do with the kids on the mission trip, and this was really cool because we didn't plan it, um, is we got to go to, it's called the Shaker Village. I think it's called the Village, but it's a Shaker uh, historic site. How many of you have heard about the Shakers? Right? Almost everybody, right? They were a religious um, sect here in the United States in the, like, 18, late 1700s, early 1800s, and I think there was some shakers up until the 80s or something like that. It, I mean, it carried on. It was the longest religious sect in America that lasted, basically. And so um, they came over from Europe, and uh, the shakers believed in egalitarian-style living, where male and female were equal, um, and, and they had raucous singing, and, and dancing, and there's reports of farmers that just despised the Shakers because they could hear them from miles away when they had worship on Sunday mornings because they would be stomping and yelling and shaking the whole house, all right? We got to, I hope we show that video because we got to take part in a Shaker dance, so we better show that next week. But um, as we were learning about them, we learned of a lady named Patsy Robert Williamson, and she was an African-American shaker, and her story is quite interesting, because the shakers did not have marriage, they didn't produce any children, you just joined the community, and you all were equal, and you lived that way, and people were allowed to join the community for a year and decide, is this something you want to continue to do, and if not, you head out on your own way, and so Patsy came in with a man named Naaman and his wife, Ginny, and they had like five children, and she was their slave. But because they were announcing the world, she came in as just an equal, and they lived there for a year, and Naaman and Ginny decided, oh yeah, this shaker way of living, not for us. So we're going to go back to the world, and because we have no money, we want to sell you Patsy. And the shakers go, uh, oh, we don't do that. We don't believe in that. And so the trustees of the shakers got together and they said, we're going to purchase her freedom. And she can decide whether she stays or goes. They redeemed her. And Patsy decided that she was staying. And she became a prolific shaker hymn writer and wrote all these hymns for the Shakers. It offered her a new opportunity to live and do what God had endowed her to do with arts and creativity and singing and dancing. They redeemed her from a life of hopelessness. My question for you this morning is, where in your life could you go the extra mile to show God's hesed, to show God's loving kindness? Have you been given that opportunity recently? Did you take it, or was it too risky?
as we wrestle with that, um, I just want to acknowledge the risky, overwhelming love of Jesus Christ, that it was not something that God had to do, but God chose to do it for us, his people. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. God is good. And all the time. Holy God, sometimes we overlook your love for us. Sometimes we just think that when good things happen, when things work out, it's just a coincidence instead of your spirit coming down and working all things for our good and for your glory. Lord God, if that has been our story this morning, let us give you thanks. Thankful for the ways that you have shown up where you have created a way forward, where you've brought new life or new opportunity. Lord, just like Boaz, we know that there are expectations, that we can do good, we can do just enough. But your love shows us that you go way beyond just enough. You give us more than enough. You show us that your love overreaches and brings us in even more blessings than we need sometimes. Lord, if we've been given the opportunity to be generous, to be gracious, to do a little extra for someone, help us say yes to that. Give us the hands and feet to make that happen. Lord, we pray for more good stories like Ruth's. Sometimes in our world and in the news, it is overwhelming with violence. It's overwhelming with disappointment. Lord, help us to see your goodness happening here. It might be small, but it is still good. Lord, we thank you and praise you for um, your faithfulness in our lives and in the lives of this congregation. We pray for those who have gone before us, those we are mourning today, those who cannot be with us for whatever reason. Maybe it is out of illness or sickness or depression or anxiety, or maybe there is some conflict that is keeping us separated from the ones we love. Lord, we lift that up to you today and we give them your, or we give them your, your names to to, to lift them up, Lord God. Lord, we pray for our leaders here in this city, in this country, and around the world. We pray for wisdom as each day brings us news of war, of conflict, of death, of destruction, of unsettled places, of people that are in need of food and shelter. Lord, we pray for those that are working on your behalf in those places, that are offering food and shelter to the widow and to the orphan, to the child, to the woman and man. We pray for those who are working on behalf of the prisoner. Lord, give them words to speak encouragement to come out of their mouths. We pray for those that are going into zones that are dangerous. 
because they are on a mission to bring peace, to bring your loving kindness to others. You give us more than enough. Let us trust in your provisions this day and always. We pray this in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, I'd like to invite uh, up to the chancel steps our clerk, Bill Holmes, as well as Julie Little, um, who will be installed as, uh, ordained and installed, excuse me, as a deacon today. Julie, I'll have you stand here right on the first step. Unfortunately, Julie couldn't be with us when we had everyone gathered. She was on vacation, but we're grateful that she could be with us today. Hear these words. There are different gifts, but the same spirit who gives them. There are different ways of serving God, but it's the same Lord who is served. God works through different persons in different ways, but it is the same God who achieves his purpose through them all. Each one is given a gift by the Spirit to use it for the common good. Together, we are the body of Christ and individually members of him. Though we have different gifts, together we are... Um, we are a ministry of reconciliation led by the risen Christ. We work and pray to make his church useful in the world. And we call men and women to faith so that in the end, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Within our common ministry, some members are chosen for particular work as teaching elders, ruling elders, or deacons. In ordination, we recognize these special ministries, remembering that our Lord Jesus said, whoever among you wants to be great must become a servant of all, and whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Mr. Moderator, speaking for the people of the church, I bring Julie Little to be ordained and installed as a deacon. Thank you, Bill. Julia, constitutional questions for you. God has called you to be the voice of the church to serve Jesus Christ in a special way. Please respond to the following questions as your affirmation and desire to serve. Do you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? Do you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of scripture uh, that lead us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by these confessions as you lead the people of God, do you? Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you? Will you be governed by our church's polity? Will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you? Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do you? Will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? One last question. Will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need. And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? Thank you. Do we, the members of the church, 
except Julie Little as a deacon, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ. Do we? Do we agree to pray for her, to encourage her, to respect the decisions that she and her fellow deacons make, and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? Do we? At this time, I'd like to invite um, Eddie Elders forward. Not, you don't have to be currently serving. Elders forward. We're going to lay hands on Julie, and we're going to pray for her. So elders, please come forward. If you're not an elder, you could certainly stay in your pew if you want to extend a hand as we pray for her. Uh, please feel free to do so. Let us pray together. Gracious and eternal God, with joy we give you thanks and praise. Throughout the ages, in every place, you've chosen servants from among your people to point the way to salvation by your grace. We are grateful for ancestors in the faith who followed without fear, placing their trust in you alone, for judges and monarchs who ruled in righteousness and peace, for prophets and apostles who spoke your bold words of mercy and of truth, for leaders and teachers in every age who have nurtured your people in faith and faithfulness. Above all, we praise you for Jesus Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life to set others free. Anointed by your Holy Spirit, he proclaimed your reign on earth, revealing your saving love in all he said and did. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon your servant, Julie, whom you've called by baptism as your own. Grant her the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. Give her joy in her walk of faith and a sure sense of your abiding presence for her work of ministry. Lord, pour out your spirit of power and truth upon your whole church, that we may be for you a holy people, baptized to serve you in the world. Sustain your church and ministry, ground us in the gospel, secure our hope in Christ Jesus, strengthen our service to the outcast, and increase our love for one another. Show us the transforming power of your grace in our life together, that we may be effective servants of the gospel, offering a compelling witness to the world, to the good news of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Julie, you are now a deacon in the Church of Jesus Christ for this congregation. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God through the Father. Amen. Welcome. Let's welcome Julie as a deacon. Thank you, elders. As the elders are returning to their seats, we come to our time of offering. I'd like to invite our ushers forward to receive God's tithes and offerings.
Gracious God, we give you thanks for these gifts. We acknowledge that you give us more than we could ever imagine. And so we ask that with this offering, you take it, you multiply it, and you use it to do justice, to show kindness, and to help us walk humbly in this neighborhood, in this part of the world, all for the glory of your kingdom and your son, Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. Let us sing our final hymn, Come Thou Fount. Lord, take and seal our hearts to thy courts above. May the Lord be with you as you leave this place. May he guide your feet. May he use your hands. May he speak words from your mouth of love and of mercy this week. All in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go now in peace. Amen. <laughs>